this lecture I'm going to be primarily talking about number of words in different cultures. Uh, when we look at where number words come from, it's sort of useful to think about where numbers themselves tr normally come from in various cultures. One of the things is that substantial numbers, numbers beyond about five or ten, most often come from certain kinds of needs in cultures, cultures that do trading with other places, taxation, agriculture, um, armies or other sorts of needs for large inventories of things, um, action at a distance where someone else is doing a task for you so you need to contract with them. Uh, I want some logs that are this size, I need a, some number of animals, I want you to take my uh, supplies, my uh, purchase some supplies for me or take some things to market for me, things of that sort. Um, and one of the things that's kind of uh, important is that hunter-gatherer cultures rarely really need a whole lot of numbers, at least not for these kinds of purposes. Uh, hence, s number systems in hunter-gatherer cultures are often a lot uh, sort of newer, younger, they're not quite as elaborate, um, and as a result are very often easier to decipher to sort of figure out what the numbers mean. And so a lot of the number words we're going to be looking at are, uh, come from hunter-gatherer cultures. And most of the examples, not all of them, but most of the examples I'm going to be looking at today come from uh, uh, Native American cultures, both North American and South American. Well, let's take a look, though, at the number of words themselves. What, what I'm interested in, one of the things that we, some of the things that we can get out of studying number of words themselves, uh, are the number of base that they use. We're used to a base 10, but other cultures have used base 5, 8, 10, 20, um, even occasionally base 12. Uh, and then the ways in which other cultures use addition and subtraction and multiplication and doubling uh, to construct their number words. Uh, and arithmetic that's kind of embedded within sort of the names that they use. Uh, we'll also be able to learn some stuff about how certain cultures count on their hands uh, and the very various kinds of options that we have for how we go through sort of fingers and thumbs and, uh, and hands and stuff for counting. Um, and uh, uh, although we won't spend uh, much time on it, uh, a little bit more work we can sort of use uh, uh, issues of the closeness of number words in uh, different cultures, uh, cultures especially that are geographically adjacent when we look at numbers, we can so the number of words that they use, we sometimes can understand uh, how, where the sort of uh, cultural heritage comes from, which groups were, uh, uh, you know, may have come from the same group at some earlier time, and sometimes how long ago those groups split, so that if they're using this sort of the same words for one through five, uh, and then they separate and they're using different words for six and seven, that tells us something about how long ago those particular languages and cultures uh, diverged. Now, and sometimes, in order to, to really understand what's going on with the number of words in a language, we need a language dictionary so we can sort of look up other words that are like it or search for words that are like the word for three or whatever. But not always, and we're going to be spending some time on just sort of how we can use the number of words to sort of uh, break into a, uh, a language. Well, let's start off with uh, some basic body parts here. So, um, when we have uh, somebody else who has studied a language enough to sort of understand how the, what the words mean, we can start looking at um, sort of how the, the parts of the body, the hand especially, the fingers, um, even the feet, uh, uh, are used to construct these words. So, for example, in the Atacapa language, the word for ten means to finish the hands. In Choctaw, the word for five is the first hand finished. Um, uh, the hand that has now gone away, uh, uh, a hand that has been spent, all of the fingers are gone. This is one that's kind of interesting. Hand piece. This sort of translates as hand piece. And that means the hand and then just a little piece of the next hand. Uh, 
uh, the word for seven here is referring to a pointer finger. So that tells us something about, uh, you know, we finish off one hand five, and then we've gotten up to sort of the second finger, the pointer finger here. So this, lang this uh, language is, is very likely counting six, seven, eight, nine, something of that sort. Um, in the uh, Apache language, uh, two, um, the number two refers to feet because we all have two feet. And the Omaha, in a similar sense, the word two is referring to the hands because we, we all have uh, two hands. Um, and uh, in addition to some basic uh, sort of body part words, which is where a lot of uh, number counting sort of comes from, we can tell something about the order of how they do their, their uh, finger counting. So in the Dakota language, the two is uh, something has been bent down. So the Dakota are almost certainly starting with an open hand and then counting by bending the fingers down. And the Hidatsa uh, language is everything has been turned down to get to the number five. So the sort of two principal ways of counting the hands are either by counting up or else starting with a fist and counting up or else starting with an open hand and bending things down as we go through the counting. Okay? Again, the Klamath uh, uh, language, we're bending things down. This one is sort of interesting. Three is in the middle. We're going to sort of see this in another language a little later. Uh, so, how is three in the middle? Well, I'm not, certainly not counting up, so I'm not going one, two, three, or something like that. It's very hard to imagine how we would think of this as being in the middle. On the other hand, if I'm starting like this and counting either from the thumb or the little finger and going one, two, three, well, this finger is exactly in the middle. And so that's almost certainly how they're counting. Uh, I can't tell whether they're counting first from the little finger or from the thumb over, but they're probably counting by doing something of that sort. Um, here, in a similar sense, in the Hudson Bay uh, language, uh, eight is referring to, presumably on the other hand then, the middle finger on the other hand. Okay. In uh, the southwestern, southwestern Alaskan language, uh, the word for five is related to the word for right hand. So we can sort of see that as they're counting, I can't tell here whether they're counting you know, uh, by opening the hand or by closing the hand, but the first five numbers are almost certainly all being counted on the right hand, and then the left hand would, would come in for uh, the next numbers. Um, uh, when we're doing this counting, one of the, the sort of the, the finger counting tactics uh, is whether the thumb is the first number or the last. So if I'm counting up, for example, I might go, if I'm doing fingers first, I might go one, two, three, four, and then the thumb becomes the last digit that comes up. Whereas I might also be counting one, two, three, four four usually, and five. But if I'm counting in this direction, the thumb is the first finger, and if I'm counting like this, the thumb is then the last number that's coming up. And so we can see a little bit of that, infer a little bit of this. In Cheyenne, the number nine, so this is on the second hand, um, is my fourth finger. So we know that all four fingers have come up. Similarly in Greenland, um, and in the Pawnee, the, the number four is the fingers of the hand. So the word for finger here is going to be different than thumb. So I've got the fingers and then presumably the thumb. Massachusetts, one, the number one is very small, which is referring to the little finger. So presumably both in Massachusetts uh, and in Hudson Bay, well, I'm sorry, in Massachusetts, the little finger is the first number that's being counted. And in Hudson's, Hudson Bay, again, probably on the second hand. Um, now, the little finger uh, uh, is going to be the last thing that comes in. That's hard to do if I'm counting up, okay? So that uh, when, if we're counting up and I'm trying to keep the little finger down, one, two, three, this is hard to do. And so probably they're counting down, one, two, three, four, and then and, and five, or in the second hand, that would be ten. So that's telling us something there about how they're counting. Okay? Um, and in this language, 
here the word for finger is actually referring to the, the thumb, but the number five is the thumb then in this case. Another thing we can tell when, we're, when we start to understand what the words are doing is uh, the fundamental distinction between base 10 or base 20. As I say, there are some other kinds of bases that get involved, fives and eights and, and uh, some others that we'll see. But one of the principal things is, do you count in tens or do you count in twenties? In other words, for example, are we counting our fingers or are we counting our fingers and our toes? And so if we know what these words mean, that can tell us some stuff. Um, here, in the, I clumped seven together with 13 here from this language, from Greenland. But um, here the number seven refers to going over to the other hand. So there's my first hand and then there's the other hand. And it's two on the other hand, whatever their, word, their, their hand symbol is for two. And then 13 specifically translates as on the first foot, three. So we know that we know that they're essentially doing uh, a base 20 system and that they're counting as if they were counting on both their fingers uh, and their toes. And in a few languages, uh, um, the, these, these next several languages here, these are all examples where 20 is referring to essentially an entire person, man completed, an entire man. Okay? Um, so we know that they're also doing, because since that's 20, they're also doing a base 20, an entire person is 20. And we're going to see that similarly here in uh, uh, Unalit. So the number 11 it translates to meaning it goes down from the hands to the feet, and 16 goes over to the other foot. So they're also going to be a base 20. The Pira, on the other hand, the number 10 translates Pa is one, Mole is a member of the tribe. So that is saying essentially that there's a, they're a base 10. Once we've gotten to 10, we've gotten an entire thing, an entire person. Okay. I'm going to spend a little bit more time with the Puro language. That's one where, in fact, there's an awful lot of uh, words that translate where we sort of know the root meaning. Okay. So uh, Satu means one. This variant means only one or exactly one. Uh, these, are, we don't know an etymology for the numbers two and three. And this is fairly common with the very, with small numbers. They've been around in a culture long enough that they have been modified from whatever the original meaning was. Words have diverged. They don't necessarily correspond to some particular other words that tell us where they came from. But it usually, as we get into larger and larger words, their larger numbers, uh, they haven't evolved, they haven't modified as much, and so they're connected, in many cases linguistically, to other words that we have. So once we get up to four here, um, hepi is referring, the hep here is referring to hepi, two. Uh, Kotza is some form of also. And then, so this is, this is two, also the same, okay? So something else that's the same as the original two. So fundamentally, this is saying two and another two, as if there were an addition hiding inside there. Uh, pa myo, pa again, is a pronoun that means one, or in some cases can mean another, okay? So this is, uh, translates as one hand. Here it's another. And so this is another big one finger, another big finger. Uh, we know that that certainly does, means that six is not Sorry, when we get to six, we're going over to the other hand. This is not going to be the way that we start. We're not going to start with six this way. We're not going to start with six this way. Six is going to be this way. Um, assuming that we're, we're folding up as opposed to, to, that we're opening up as opposed to folding down. Which is probably the case when we get into pointers. So seven here is another pointer rod. So we're pointing at something. So there's my number seven. Uh, this is also a pointer rod. And we've made a slight change here. So here's one pointer. And the word here for rod, the, the actual word for rod is P or pi. Um, and here it's a slight variant of that. Uh, but also they drop the one here to get sort of the, num the word eight from seven. But they're both fundamentally translating as uh, another pointer rod. 
And then nine is, is a small one, okay? The muturo means small one, and xi here is a finger. So we sort of can tell now what's going on here with the numbers. I've gone six, seven, eight, the small one for nine, and then when I open up all ten, I have one member of the tribe. Uh, the PhD thesis were that, that analyzed the pure words and learned as much as they could and, and translated as much as possible. Unfortunately, it doesn't tell us what happens after 10. It would be kind of nice. Uh, uh, she just writes that, that after that, that are, what we have are combinations of numerals from 1 to 10. And I wish that we knew what they were so we could see how the addition or possibly multiplication plays out in there. But this is an interesting translation here for 10, and it tells us a lot about how uh, their hand gestures are representing the numbers. I'm going to look at some additional examples now of uh, arithmetic that is embedded in certain sorts of number words in different languages. Multi addition, multiplication, and occasionally subtraction. We'll see a few other examples of subtraction later. Um, here, the uh, uh, Atacapa uh, word for nine translates it as without the little finger. So it's everything except the little finger. Fundamentally, uh, we're essentially being a, a subtraction, 10 minus 1. Although, again, as with the Puro, it's telling us something about how they're counting on their fingers when they do that. Um, in Omaha, the numbers for 7 and 8 um, are specifically referring to finger two of the second hand, finger three of the second hand. So again, there's a slight implicit five plus two and a five plus three. Um, not quite as explicit as sometimes happens in English and other uh, languages that have been around longer in a base 10 system. I wanted to emphasize, though, that even in English, when we do this, and we'll see this in some of the other languages, and it's important to keep in mind that if I look at something like 15, it's fundamentally coming from 5 and 10, but nevertheless, the words have been modified. We can't expect to see words, um, the base number words that are being used in larger combinations without being willing to put up with some modifications. So 5 has become 5th, and 10 has become teen, and in 4t6, the 4 has changed a little bit, and the 10 has, tr has changed actually quite a bit, the TY. But this is also an example of multiplication and addition. And again, this sort of thing lots of languages have, although not always being multiplied by 10. The multiplying by 10 is very specifically uh, happening in a base 10 system. Some cases, once we get above 13, actually 14, 13 and 13 are not all that easy. But above 13, um, the numbers have a very regular structure, and we can sort of see how that structure is uh, built. Uh, and with smaller numbers, we really can't. Now, 11 and 12 do have structure in here, um, but it's not all that easy to see. They've been around for a long time. 12 originally comes from 2 left. So if you say 2 left real fast, you get pretty close to 12, and I'll give us several hundred years of uh, trying to say that, saying that phrase, and it's going to get shrunk down to 12. Okay, this it refers to two left after a base of 10. Okay, and uh, there are a lot of languages where they will be saying things and, uh, and implying a, an addition to some base form. So I might say and a three to mean some fundamental base number plus three. Uh, and, uh, uh, and sometimes that's what we're going to have to look for when we're trying to sort of decipher some words ourselves. So 12 is referring to 2 left after 10. Um, and in, the 10 plus 2 is kind of in there, but the 10 plus is certainly um, uh, implicit and not explicit. 11, if we drop off the E, which comes later, is it fundamentally derived from left 1. And again, if you said that a whole lot of times, uh, you would, it would get shrunk down to 11. Um, and then maybe to make it clearer, we add the vowel at the beginning so that it sort of stands out a little bit better. But again, implicitly, that's one left after the 10 has been taken out. And then uh, one final example here. Uh, the Karok is a kind of an interesting 
language from this viewpoint, and so I've got a couple of numbers here. And so the number five, the number two is exact, and the number five is actually trope. But one thing that happens a lot with something like five, sometimes also happens with ten, but especially with five, which stands for hand, which stands for lots of things, is you can end up in a culture having several different words that fundamentally mean five. And so when they're just talking about five, they use the word trope. But uh, when they're constructing other name, other numbers from this, the word that they're using for five is anifkir, or however that would should be pronounced. Okay. So this really is a word for five, even though if I give you the entire list of uh, numbers for number words for Karak, that wouldn't be on the list there by itself. But this does stand for two and five. Okay. And then when we get to twelve, this is the this is the actual number for ten, so tre trehar is ten. Karu is sort of a a, a long width, um, not not quite as uh, implicit an addition sign as is happening here. This is much more explicit, saying I have 10 plus 2, in this case, to get 12. And so then when we get up to 17, it's going to be 10 along with 2 and 5. And so here we actually have sort of a double addition um, the happening within the system. Uh, some languages will do this. Uh, the, um, the Yoruba in Nigeria, for example, have uh, a fairly extensive addition multiplication process. And so, unfortunately, their words, as they start getting larger and larger, um, have lots and lots of pieces in them. And they can sort of take, take a while to say, uh, which has resulted in, uh, as they get more, as the Yoruba have gotten more into uh, sort of modern trading and accounting and stuff, their, their, their numbers are being replaced by uh, um, uh, Islamic and uh, I should say Arabic, uh, Arab number systems because their numbers are just kind of too complicated. But it's interesting to see with a system like this kind of the level of arithmetic that sometimes gets embedded um, in them. Now switching away here for just a moment from uh, the from number words, this is a picture uh, from Claudia Zaslavsky's Count on Your Fingers African Style. She spent a lot of time in Kenya, and uh, so these are three different um, ways of, on their hands, expressing the number um, eight. And uh, so in, in the Kamba, we can see that what they've done, what, what he's doing is fundamentally one hand grasping three fingers on the other side, and hence implicitly saying that uh, we have an addition of five plus three. Whereas the taita for the number eight would instead take both hands, kind of hide the thumbs, and I've got four here and four here. So here we've got eight equals five plus three. Here we have four plus four. And then the Maasai uh, represent four by, represent eight by taking the number four and then waving the hand. So the waving the hand amounts to doubling. Unfortunately, I don't know whether waving three fingers gives you six, but waving four hands she records as uh, representing the number eight. So there's several different ways. Uh, these two are both addition forms, and this is a doubling form. And there are a lot of other uh, words that use that concept of doubling in one form or another. Doubling is a common kind of arithmetic for creating uh, larger numbers, um, and sometimes having as well. So here the number 12 is coming from 6 and 2, not an addition form. This is a multiplication form. So I'm taking 6 and I'm multiplying it by 2. This is 2 times 5. Uh, this literally translates as 4 again. Okay? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I get that backwards. It's again 4. So this is another way of, of wording a doubling. Um, here, we're again using two and three, but there's an implicit multiplication process there and here. So the Kuchin, uh, as well as some of these other languages, 
are implicitly doubling, as, uh, implicitly multiplying, as opposed to implicitly adding. Okay? Um, and this one, this is again sort of like what I was saying, uh, the, the example I used before that I said I was going to come back to. So the word here means halfway, but it's three. It's halfway to what? Well, it's halfway to five. And again, that's the concept of in the middle that we had in, that, in the earlier language. So this is a halfway. And, and we can tell, you know, this is not, as I said, it can't be going like this. How is this half of your hand? It, it, it isn't, okay? But if I'm counting along on the fingers, yes, that's halfway to the end of the hand, okay? So um, doubling and halving. Uh, the number five here from, for, from the Pawnee is referring to, it literally translates as half hands. So it's referring to both hands and then sort of cutting them in half as opposed to saying one hand or something like that. Okay? This is a doubling action of both hands. Uh, these are having actions for the body. So th these are clearly coming from a from base 20 systems, where we're saying that the word for 10 is half of the body. Um, there's another one of these related languages that uses a, a, a word similar to this. I, I hope you can sort of see that there's a linguistic connection between using this half, the upper half of the body in this language and the upper half of the body in this language, both of which are from uh, the southern Alaska. Okay. I want to spend a ton, some time looking at um, a particular example in just a little bit more detail to see some of the arithmetic that's hiding in here. And what I'd like to be able to do here, I haven't done the translation, I don't have that up here for us, and we're going to try and take a look at this and understand where these words are coming from. So this is kind of the reverse engineering. One, one thing that's interesting is to sort of try and use linguistic knowledge to understand what the words are, are doing. But the other is to then use mathematical knowledge to try and see if we can reverse engineer what the words are meaning and how these are, uh, how the, the, the numbers are being put together. Okay. So, um, uh, again, small words we don't try and translate because they have we would have to linguistically know what they're connected to. Um, the smallest number that we have, this one, chika or matuli, uh, both represent some form of, of uh, the number five. Uh, and we'll see both of those sort of coming up here a little bit later. And I suspect one of them comes from hand, but again, there are often multiple sorts of words within a language that can represent uh, that. As we're looking here, then, um, right after this, we can see the root number five sort of embedded here, although in slight variations, but we saw that in uh, 15, 13 in, in English as well. So here's the number five, and then here are the numbers for one, two, three, and four in almost exactly this order. There's a slight variation in how, this part, on how the number three is being pronounced here. Um, but so what we're seeing here is a 5 plus 1, 5 plus 2, 5 plus 3, and a 5 plus 4, okay? Then we get up to a number 10, and we don't, uh, we don't necessarily expect all of our words to be able to translate into something. Um, I look at this, and I try and look back to see if there's any connection with anything back here. I don't see anything uh, uh, that jumps out at me. Uh, there's some vague similarity between this word and this word, but not enough to really think that they're connected. Uh, so we have to just think of this as being a word that may mean whole person, or it might mean upper half of the person, or it might mean finished, um, as in all ten numbers finished. We don't know what this means etymologically. We would have to have a language dictionary. It's not composed of smaller number words. So we just leave this as if it's its own fundamental word, but now we can go through and decipher some of the rest of these as we see, again, our numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4. Again, a variation of 3 here. Not quite the same, but close enough, and, we can, and since we can see this pattern here, we know that this word is, in fact, some variation of the number 3. And this on is presumably 
uh, a form of and, or an implicit addition. Okay. And then we go over to 15, and again, not something that we necessarily try and figure out how to decipher this, but we're seeing the same pattern here. 1, 2, 3, and 4. So whatever 15 is standing for, this is 15 plus 1, 15 plus 2, etc. When we get to 20 now, there's a new word here, quali, and this word is not immediately clear what that means. If I look over at the base words, it might it seem close to this word, it might seem close to this word. It's hard to be absolutely certain here. So we want to be a little bit careful. One of the things that we do as we're trying to decipher the words, though, is we need to look for patterns and larger things. And so if I'm not sure whether this word is connected to one or two, then I can go up to the number 40. And 40 here, uh, well, now it's pretty clear. We have two koali. So this must be one koali, and koali must mean, must correspond to a number 20. And so this is, you know, 120 and two 20s. This is 120 and 10. Two 20s and 10. Uh, so I hope you can see that this is a base 20 system. If this were a base 10, 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s would correspond to, to numbers like 2s, 3s, 4s, and 5s. But here we have one Puali, one Puali and, and 10, two Puali, two Puali and 10. And if we continue and look at some of these larger numbers, Masuil Puali, if Puali means 20, this is probably 5. And we can see that this is connected to the other word for 5. Okay. And if we go down to 200 Puali, uh, this should be correspond to 10. There it is. 10 times 20, and 300 is 15 twenties. And this is interesting now because when we get to 400, 400 is 20 twenties, and this is all based off of a, a 20 system. And so here I have 5 twenties, 10 twenties, 15 twenties, now I have 20 twenties at this point. And so now we get this brand new word, suitly. And again, sen here, um, well, we've deciphered some earlier stuff. So we had one being C, C and SEM, and so we're not too surprised to see one 400, especially when we know that the word for 800 is, starts with all. Oh, there's two. So that's one simply and two simply. Okay. So we can sort of decipher this entire thing. Now, this is a reasonably simple structure here. It's a base 20, which is a little unnatural for most of us. Uh, but other than that, it's just a standard addition, multiplication, very much like the English sort of construction for our, our number words, except for using that base 20. Other things will get a little bit harder. Okay. So let's do one uh, more example, um, which is going to have just a little bit more uh, complications in it. And we'll show some of the other kinds of things that we, uh, that we run into. So one more um, example of trying to decipher the meanings of some of these words. Uh, and I'm starting off with the, the first five numbers as being base words that we don't try to decipher. I'll mention this is a, a, a language, the Maidu language. There are four main versions of the Maidu language family. Uh, this one is referred to as the Northwest Maidu or often as the Kankau um, language. Uh, this is a particular, actually the Kankau dialect is one of the languages of, one of the dialects of the Northwest Maidu language. Uh, and this is in Northern California, um, getting actually not too far away from, from Oregon. Okay. Um, and Maidu is the name of the language and they also think of it as the name of the people and so, uh, my do all by itself is essentially the word for man. Um, and so, the number 20 here uh, is representing one person. Woko is related to this word, Wikta. And so, this is one full man. So, we're expecting a base 20 um, out of this. Uh, 
you know, one person is all of their fingers and all of their toes. Okay? And uh, one of the things that's sort of useful when we're looking through a language, especially if we don't see patterns right away, is not necessarily to start off at the small numbers. We don't necessarily want to try and decipher them. It worked all right in, the, uh, in our previous example, because that was a fairly straightforward structure. Uh, but most of the time, uh, we're kind of better off to go into the larger numbers. Small numbers have very often evolved over time, and some of the simple patterns that were in there, vowels have gotten squished, things have gotten simplified, something else has been substituted for one of the numbers because we often had dozens, uh, you know, as a unit or something like that. And uh, so if we go to larger numbers, we can sometimes see the pattern fairly easily. So for example, we have my Duke Woko here, and it's at base 20. And so now when we do another 20, we're seeing the number for 2, Pena Ma. And so we can see that Ma is being used as a contraction of my do. Okay, so it's 2 men. Okay. And if we go then up to 60, we see Sapwi Ma. For some reason, both of these languages and English keep doing variations of 3. So the number 3 here is Sapu, and we're seeing it here is Sapwi. In the same sense that in English we see three, but we see 13 and 30. Uh, but Sapwi now becomes the number for three, and so there are three men. And Soye is four men. And Matsini is five men. And we see here a slight variation, Matsini, Matsini here, at least as, the, as it's been recorded. Um, this is a slight vowel shift, uh, and a slight different variation in sort of how it's being uh, pronounced um, uh, over five, but we can see this as the number five. Okay, so now we, that gives us some interesting structure here in the main 20s. Okay. And if we look then in, in the middles, remember since the base is 20, we expect 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100 uh, to be our fundamental base. And I should emphasize because it's kind of easy for us uh, in our sort of number chauvinism to think that there's going to be something special about 100. Uh, and, you know, we've got, just gone to three digits, and it seems like 100 is sort of a special, nice round number. And we might expect to see new words at 100. But remember in a base 20, as happened in our previous example, we didn't see a new word until 2020s. Okay? The number 400 becomes special. 100 is just another multiple of 20. So we don't expect to see anything special here. And when we look at our intermediates, in every case, we're seeing matsak, ni. Uh, this is interesting. It's not one man plus 10. This is, this number here corresponds to 40. And when we look at 50, this number here is corresponding to 60. This number here is corresponding to 80. And this number here is corresponding to 100. This is a technique, uh, a number counting technique that seems fairly common, that's referred to as overcounting. So we're referring not to the number we had before, the sort of the previous round number with some stuff being added, but we're saying that we're 10 towards this number. So we're referring to a number sort of later on. Uh, to say this concept, uh, it's, it's, it's referred to as overcounting. This is a larger number, and we're referring to that. So this number right here, this word right here, is referring to, essentially translates as the word towards. So matsok is referring to, and we can see the number 10 hiding in there, okay? So this is 10 towards 40. This number is 10 towards 60. 10 towards 80, and 10 towards 100. That now, when we were just looking at these numbers, where this is a very simple structure, well-defined structure, that will help us when we come over here and start looking at these words, because now we understand what this word ni means. It means something towards. And so here, now, we understand basically all of these numbers here, 
So if I come back here, 10 is a number that's, that we just think of as a base, base number. And now this is towards, and this is all towards Hiwali. And Hiwali is the number for 15. Not something that I try and break down. I don't see any way of breaking this down, for example, three hands. No, no, it doesn't have the word three in it any place. What does this word mean? I have no idea. Might mean foot, for example. Remember, this is base 20, so we're thinking about both hands and feet. So this might be related to the word foot, um, as opposed to sort of three hands. But whatever it is, we just think of this as a base word, so I don't have any kind of meaning here. I'm not trying to figure out I'm not trying to break this down in terms of the other numbers. But now I see that this is, after 10, this is 1 towards 15, 2 towards 15, 3 towards 15, and 4 towards 15. And then we can see exactly the same structure here. My Duke Woko, remember, is our one man. And so now I have 1, 2, 3, and 4 towards 20. Uh, again, it's an implicit we know that we're starting at 15 and then we're working our way towards 20. Um, uh, I should pause for a moment and mention that although I refer to this as a base 20, uh, there's elements of base 5 in here as well. And when we get around, uh, when a, a culture gets around to writing down number symbols, uh, especially if they're using a place notation, they have to decide whether they're a base 5 or a base 20 or base 10, or whatever. You have to decide that. You have to know what each digit's place is representing. But when we're using words, we're allowed to kind of have two different bases in there simultaneously. The Babylonian number system has sort of a base 60, but also sort of a base 10. It has them kind of combined together. And this has a base 5 um, embedded in there as well, in the sense that here at the beginning, every 5, Matsani, Matsoko, Ali and Maidukuoko, each of them sort of introduce a new word, and that is then a base. And the other things are all done with reference to that multiple of five. Uh, so when we're talking about one towards 20, it's not, we, we don't have to wonder whether we're starting at 10 and then going one towards 20, okay? No, 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 if, we're, if we were a little past 10, we would be going one towards 15. Okay, the base five in there, the, 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 the groups of five, become fairly important. So I don't need to mention them. So if I'm, if I'm two towards 15, I know that that's starting from 10, starting from one of the multiples of five to the next multiple of five. I'm two towards the next multiple of five. You know, the sapwe ni maiduk woko, it's three towards it, but starting from 15, which I don't need to say, that, that's implicit. So now that we've sort of worked our way back, back to the number 10, and we've been able to translate that, and so now we have a better chance at, in some sense, deciphering the smaller numbers. But I held on the, onto those for a little while, okay? And um, uh, because sometimes the pattern isn't as simple when we get down into small numbers. So when we look at these, we can see some stuff going on here. Um, here's penny, okay? So there's the word for two. And so that's not, not, we're not surprised by the fact that we're seeing a matsan, which is five. So this is fundamentally five plus two, okay? Um, this one we recognize because we understand this word now. So this is four towards masoko, ten. Okay, so nine. We're almost to Matsoko. But this word, if, if we had been trying to figure this out before, before we had done all of the rest of this stuff, this, this word might have confused us um, in terms of, of how this was being structured. But let's take a look at these two words here. So, Sai Soko and Soye Soko. Okay, what do those mean? Um, well, this is. Again, larger numbers are usually easier. And here I'm seeing the number four, and so I have four soko. Well, this is fundamentally the word for doubled, or uh, actually it translates as again. So this is four again. 
This then, psi soco, well, that's, it's not quite so obvious that this is a variation of three, but we've already seen several variations of three, sapwi, for example. And uh, now that we've interpreted, we've figured out sort of what these things are, especially this doubling here. You know, so if I've got four and soco, that might be four again, or four doubled, or, well, it can't be four times two, because this word is nothing like the word for two. But it's some form of doubling. And so now we can see that this is almost surely three doubled. So psi is, comes from sapu, and this is psi doubled. Okay. Can't get seven by doubling, so they had to get five plus two. And in fact, now that we know that this is three doubled and four doubled, we actually can break the number five down a little bit smaller. We have a doubling here, and ma, of course, is fundamentally um, the word for hand. Okay, so here we it eventually becomes short for my duke, but with these smaller numbers, or possibly just when it's used at the beginning of a word. So here I'm using it at the end of a word. Maybe to them that always imp implies that it's a contraction of my do. And when I'm using it at the beginning of the word, um, that this is somehow referring to hand. So if this is hand all by itself, this is ma double. This might actually correspond to hand completed, or hand alone, or even hand away, as we saw in one other language. But again, we're fundamentally thinking of that as a single individual word, and here we're seeing the, the contraction of it, possibly. Or maybe, as I say, this is hand something, and this is hand doubled. So that gives us uh, the opportunity to sort of go through here. This is the way we're going to be doing some additional exercises like this. And uh, um, there are surprisingly large numbers of languages in which we can sort of go through and do this reverse engineering, decipher what the words mean. Occasionally, we need hints. Um, and, uh, uh, but we want to take a look, as we're doing that, we want to keep track of the fact that we sometimes have that concept of uh, something a little bit towards something. Uh, or sometimes, instead of being an addition, two numbers adjacent might actually correspond to a subtraction, as they do in some languages, usually not by much. We saw one example earlier where we had 10 minus 1, and that's not uncommon. One before something. Uh, a subtraction of one is a fairly common construction in words, something that amounts to just before or one less than. Uh, subtraction of anything more than one is kind of uncommon. Um, additions are common, multiplications are common. This uh, some amount towards something else uh, is less common, but is still not infrequent. So there are a variety of ways of putting these sorts of uh, uh, constructions together to form number systems. And uh, we've gone through a couple of examples here, and we'll be doing sort of more examples in our class. And that's it for today's lecture.